<laughs> hey, look at that over there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh, crazy, man. Oh, baby. It's like a dream. And is it fast? Especially since he souped it up. What'd you do to hop it up anyway, Joe? Oh, I pick up a couple of jugs over here. Got a real neat bargain on it. Oh, yeah? yeah? You don't have to worry about money now that you've got the paycheck coming in every week, Joe. I've got that job lined up at the Olympic Cleaners. It comes through. Mo man says I can quit school. Yeah, but who wants to work in a smelly old laundry? Well, it's better than going to school, isn't it? School is for kids. And what do you think you are? Come on, lay off, will you? It doesn't matter how he makes it, just as long as he gets a buck. That's what I always say. <laughs> Boss told me he was going to give me a job driving the delivery truck now. Raising pay. Crazy. Yeah. Hey, I can go up to the gas station and buy gas from you now. Yeah, but, uh, well, I, I don't work at the gas station anymore. But I got a better job all lined up now, all set up. Having a baby. You bet he has. Joe Conklin is one. Mike here is another. High school dropouts, boys and men's jobs. Not good jobs, of course, but jobs with paychecks that can buy an old jalopy or pay for its gas or cover the tab on a big Saturday night. They're not bad boys, these dropouts, not delinquents, not hoods, not yet, that is. They may not even be stupid or backward or lazy. This is Pete, a nice boy, as a matter of fact, just one of almost a million American youngsters who didn't make the grade at high school last year. What makes a school casualty? This is harder work than Bill might be doing in the classroom right now. What makes him trade English, math, history, science for a broom and a dollar ten an hour? Why is a dropout? School people in many American cities have been asking this question, checking cases like this one doing research, thinking hard about so terrible a waste of youth, so big a leak in our manpower reserve, so great a failure in our educational system. <laughs> but the reasons why a third of these students will leave school without diplomas are not simple. You can't put all the blame on the individual pupil or his family, or on our schools, or on our economic or our social system. Many hidden forces may be pushing this Jack or that jail to the point of giving up. Dropouts, educators have found, just don't happen overnight. They take years to develop. Let's go back to the childhood of Joe Conklin, dropout. Did you talk to McGinnis about the new job? No, I thought I'd wait. Wait, 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 wait for what? Your whole life is going by. Pretty soon it's going to be too late. Look, will you leave me alone? I just want to wait. Well, what you Joe learned quite early in life that the name Conklin was not oh. something to be proud of. Look, I'm doing the best I can. That's just the trouble. You are doing the best you can. It isn't very much, is it? In this day and age, how anybody can make a lousy $68 a week, I don't understand. Everybody's making money. But, you know, everything isn't good enough for you. If you take after your father, it can only mean you're stupid. And yet a small boy needs a man to take after. Someone to respect and learn from. I'm getting sick of this. Are you through now? And the kids are beginning to take after you, too. What kind of an example are you setting for them? They aren't doing their work. They're getting behind in school. I had to go see Joe's teacher the other day. I'll get him to do his lessons. Not all dropouts come from homes as unhappy as Joe's. But most of them do have parents who feel they are economic and social failures, who never read a book, who consider school a necessary nuisance, a waste of time. He's just taking after his stupid, no-good father. Why don't you lay off me? I'm so stupid and you're so smart. You and your smart family, you got two brothers on relief. Even in those years, way back, Joe was in trouble in the classroom. He had a pretty good head for figures, but you can't be any good in arithmetic if you can't read the problem. And, add, add, addition. Addition, uh, Point, point C, a bridge, bridge, 
One eighth mile long. Long must be built. Built over a ra ravine. Ravine. Would someone else like to come up and help us with our problem? A teacher with 45 youngsters to handle just isn't able to spend enough time on a fifth grade boy who can't read. In addition at point C, a bridge an eighth of a mile long must be built over a ravine. The extra charge estimated by the subcontractor is 8,000... So by the age of 10, Joe was already starting to become a failure in terms of the school situation. He didn't like the kids who showed him up so easily. He didn't like teachers who seemed bent on making a fool of him. Not all his classmates were bright, but if they could read, they could get along. Many of them needed more help than they could get in the overcrowded classroom. Quite a few were working well below their intelligence levels. They all needed encouragement and higher standards to push them to their real learning potential. But there was no time for individual teaching. At least they could read. They had the key to the door of learning. But children like Joe just floundered in a sea of dancing letters that wouldn't shape themselves into words and sentences. If Joe had lived in another city, he might have found his way into a remedial reading class like this one. For many children have trouble translating the written word into sound and meaning. Today, most schools provide special help for such children. Most of us caught the knack of learning to read early and easily. We never think of reading as a complicated function of eye, ear, speech organs, brain, memory, and motivation. But for those who have trouble in any one of these areas, learning to read is a formidable process, a bitter, painful struggle. There must be some word wrong. What word is this? For it was late. Four. It was late. Four starts with an F, doesn't it, Jim? This starts with a W-H. Like why or when. It was late. When. All right. When poor readers are helped, they not only improve in all their other subjects, but their attitude toward school and often to life is greatly changed. The ability to read is a source of inner strength, a power that no one can take away. Did you just know it, or did you figure it out? Well, no, not exactly. But you can tell the A is long because the E on the end. All right, then that's our rule. But these youngsters need the help that can only come from a specially trained teacher who has the time that it takes to move over one hurdle after the other, who has the techniques and the patience that are required, who is given the opportunity to work with each child as an individual problem. Think of a word that starts with the same sound that you can spell. When Kate, do you remember this was the girl's name? Think of the word, that, the letter that starts Kate. Broke the plate. You remember the word we used to illustrate the beginning of plate? Something you like to do? By the gate. Think of a word that starts with the same sound as gate. But such help takes planning and budget. Like 80% of our school dropouts, Joe was a problem reader whose problem was never solved. There are other forces that influence a small boy's attitude towards school pressures in the outside world. There are wonderful things in this world, and if you happen to be poor, the things seem more important than they are. A small boy is not unaware of our pressures to have, to get, to own things. In church, in newspapers, on television screens, 
Juvenile delinquency and character breakdown are deplored. But on the street, in every town, we are hawking the tawdry wares of a spurious paradise. And no one is selling patience, hard work, higher values, let alone forbearance. But look, it's on sale, half price. You can't afford not to at least look at it. Well, all right. Let's go in. The Joes are affected more strongly than other children by such pressures because they are the have-nots, and their hungers are consequently sharper. Deprived of real love, of security, of the inner strength that comes from regular growth and achievement, they are quick to accept the idea that the adult world is a grab bag, and hence that grabbing is the quickest way of growing up. Boy, that Sebastian's got it made. Take a look at this car. Yeah, I wonder what this set him back. He told me he got a wonderful deal on it. 36 months to pay, too. The Joes aren't stupid, boys. What's good for the goose can't be bad for the gosling. School, they say, is for kids. By the time Joe was 15, he was being kept in school by law. School to him was a battlefield, the scene of a hundred lost campaigns. Was it any wonder he hated it, even then? He had no real friends, no interests in common with the youngsters who were winning their individual battles. He had no one to turn him around and guide him through the maze of his own confusion. Joe was alone and chose to spend much of his time alone. Hooky, we used to call it. Joe and his friends call it goofing off. Joe was a fugitive from failure. It's not really fun, but at least you're out of prison, away from nagging parents, away from disappointed teachers splattering you with a steady stream of D's and F's. Who cares? Why worry about teachers? Life is short. The game may be pointless, but at least you win once in a while. Some potential dropouts find a lifeline thrown to them by chance. Danny Knox was a contemporary of Joe, and like him, a youngster who had reached ninth grade with no real links between him and school. He wasn't doing well in class, and he had no real reason for trying any harder. He, too, hated the whole setup. But then one day, at the suggestion of an attentive teacher, he decided to try out for the track squad. Now, Danny, that's a pretty good try. Uh, as I told you earlier, we just put you in here for experiments, see how much spring you had. And there's probably nothing wrong with your spring. However, from watching out here in the warm-up, I'm sure that you have better leg speed and we probably should get you in a sprint. So before you go up today, we'd like to try you in a 100-yard dash. Okay. The cinder path was to become Danny's road to friends, to a sense of belonging in school, to personal achievement, and eventually to better classroom grades. Extracurricular activity would help him to find his way back to the curriculum. And Danny, the thing that uh, I'm really enthused about is you run here with all these sprinters, men and 120 men and men off our sprint relay team here, and you ran third place in that. It's a real surprise, and your time is 10-7. Nice job. And, uh, I realize you're new out here for track, but you find 10 7 is pretty remarkable for a new boy out here in his first time trial. So, uh, 
track is something that you have to work real hard at. It takes a lot of uh, time and a lot of attention to detail. But I'm sure if you want to be with us, well, we want you and we'll work hard with you. And the men here will be happy to have you among our group out here. Nice go. Thank you. Thank you. After school activities often help young people understand why they must study. Making A's and B's is often too abstract a goal for an adolescent. But the promise of career and prestige is a tangible target to shoot at. High school programs like this Candy Striper Club show youngsters what their roles may be in later years. Roles that can only be played if their schoolwork earns them the right to take their parts. A few hours a week of adult responsibility can be a bridge to increased maturity. Today, most high schools have specialists who watch over the academic careers of the students. School counseling, still grossly understaffed in most of our communities, is the best antidote to underachievement, the strongest deterrent to dropouts. The school counselor is trained to watch for danger signs and to help in an emergency. He sees the students as persons with individual problems. No, pretty good. I was a little bit disturbed when I received this six weeks grade report. I thought you were going to pick up in English a little bit. Well, it all seems sort of pointless to me. Pointless? Well, I think I'm going to quit school at the end of the semester. Well, what seems to be the trouble? Well, everything in general, I guess. Isn't your boyfriend graduating this semester? Yes, he might get a scholarship to state. Does this have something to do with your decision? Yes, but the main reason is my parents. Well, what seems to be the difficulty? I just want a little freedom. They just treat me like a child. I'm just tired of it. Everything I do, everything I say. My mother asked to even come with me when I buy my clothes. It just seems like she doesn't even trust me. They tell me who I can go out with, what time I have to be in. I have to bring my friends to the house before I can go out with them or anything. It's just terrible. I feel like I'm in prison. Have you talked this over with Bob? Yes, I have. He isn't pushing me at all. Of course, he doesn't want me to quit. Well, what are you going to do? Well, get a job, any kind of a job. What could you do? Oh, I could get a job in the department store or a waitress, anything. Is that really the kind of job you want? Well, no, I'd like to be a secretary, but I realize that takes education and a high school diploma. Do you think you could make enough at these jobs to live as you are now? Hmm. I think I could manage. Really? Of course you couldn't. You're really after independence. But I, I wonder if this is a way to go about it. You might wind up with less freedom than you have now. If you stay in school a little while longer, you'll be on the road to real independence, if it only means getting the kind of job you want. Now, I know you could get along with your parents if you really wanted to. Why don't you think it over a little while longer? Well, I don't think there's anything to think about it. I've made up my mind, and I don't like school, and I want to drop out. Like Joe, Linda is anxious to grow up. Now, not later. She feels that leaving school means leaving humiliation and childhood behind. The counselor who understands adolescents and respects them can very often help them to change their minds. But Joe reached the beginning of his 11th year in the school system without counseling, without any real ties to fellow students, without motivation for the hard work of overcoming his scholastic handicaps. That first day of the 11th grade was the day Joe Conklin went out into the world, dropped out into the world by the back door. Even then, he wasn't sure he was doing the right thing. Even youngsters who hate school have strong feelings holding them to the pattern of our system. He wasn't breaking any law now, but he felt as though he were. For few 16-year-old boys are men. They still need the companionship of other 16-year-olds. They still need supervision and protection. The grown-up's world is frightening and challenging, even when it is attractive.
All day long, Joe struggled for a decision. He wandered and looked at the fascinating surface of the adult's world, wanting to get into it, wondering how. This was a day Joe would always remember. The day he started the endless task of trying to gain entrance into a strange world without a passport. Most schools in America today are trying to keep their Joes from dropping out. All surveys prove that without high school diplomas, the children of the age of automation are virtually doomed to a miserable life. Even the simplest opportunities that are open to young people demand a fair amount of academic achievement, and the schools are aware of the situation. One of the helpful steps that educators are taking is the expansion of curriculum to fit the needs of individual students. Courses that involve the personal interests of the students are being added in the hope that they may motivate harder work in the academic subjects that are related to them. All right, that's 60,000 is over. That's good enough. Finish your cut. Go ahead and start your machine. What is your dwell? 35. 35. And even if they fail to improve scholastically, many of them are gaining skills and self-confidence that will help them in the adult world. Some schools have organized programs of work experience education and have added a new specialist to the high school faculty. This man arranges part-time jobs for students who might otherwise become dropouts. He contacts local businessmen who can offer employment under approved conditions. But he is an educator, not an employment agent. If the student cannot learn on the job, it is not acceptable. He found this building operation, for instance. The electrical contractor was willing to take on a junior apprentice with the idea of breaking him into the craft while he finished his schoolwork. Gus works four hours a day at tasks that are constantly showing him why he must learn math, a subject that almost caused him to flunk out. Now that he deals with numbers and fractions in his calculations, the math doesn't seem so mysterious. The work experience educator makes it his business to visit the building site at intervals to see that Gus is right for the job and the job is right for Gus. For Gus is still in school. He spends four hours a day in class under a special program that will enable him to graduate along with his proper grade. Many of the boys and girls who are enrolled under this work experience plan show a considerable increase of interest in their entire school program. Have there ever been any cases in which the Attorney General and the Public Defender were up against each other in court? They are more serious, they try harder, they do not have to be pushed to learn. For one thing, their confidence in themselves has been restored. For another, they do not feel that they are alone, humiliated, branded as failures. And thirdly, they see some hope for their futures. They are assured that they will enter the adult world by the front door. Little wonder they are interested in what goes on in that world. But the 4-4 plan, as it is called, does not operate impersonally. The progress of the students is constantly checked by supervisor and counselor. Mm -hmm. And we finally found him a job with Mr. Calaris, a, an electrical contractor. How is he doing in the classroom now, by the way? Very good. Uh, his grades are coming up. I talked to his instructor, and he's getting along better with the other students and himself as well. He's beginning to learn the practical value of what he's learning here. You've talked with his parents? I talked to his parents just last week, and they're delighted with the change of attitude. And, of course, I'm very happy because this means he'll be able to graduate from school. Our Joe got a job when he left school a year ago. Then he got a car, souped it up, found himself a girl. Now at 17, he's lost that job and two others. 
The unskilled worker is the last to be hired and the first to be fired. Every new machine, every business recession ends his employment once again. And so Joe will go on searching for jobs, seeking the way in, driving to nowhere. When did he lose his way? Would someone like to volunteer to help us with this? Why don't you do something about it? Are you through now? Over a ravine. ravine. Doesn't matter how you get it, just as long as you get the buck. That's what I always say. For Joe and thousands and thousands like him, there are no counselors, no remedial reading classes, no help at school or at home, no help from community agencies. And remember, almost a million Joes a year drop out of school and are lost. Lost to their time, lost to themselves. For a little while, Joe still has a chance. If his community, his school, his neighbors want to help, if he himself wants to be helped, he can still turn back and rediscover what he has given up, the chance to learn. If he doesn't, his search will be endless. There is no shortcut. <laughs> 